Muy buenas tardes. Very good afternoon to everyone. Uh, I am delighted to be here today in the company of two very distinguished thinkers, uh, very outspoken thinkers, Jody Dean, Todd May. In this session, which is the second of three, uh, in which we will be discussing uh, whether there is such a thing as a post neoliberal order. This um, should be a constructive uh, dialogue, a constructive conversation in which we try to explore what comes next. Um, sort of, is there life after death? And is there life after death? Uh, that was a very frequent phrase during the debt crisis um, in the in the 80s and 90s in Latin America. Well, now we should think, is there life after neoliberalism and what is that going to uh, look like? Um, both uh, Jody and Todd May uh, have been uh, very, very uh, thoughtful and provoking in their thoughts on these subjects. And I think Mexico is also at the center of uh, one of the many branches of this discussion today. So I am thrilled that the Feria Internacional del Libro, that uh, the Center for Latin American Studies, CALAS, and that the Universidad de Guadalajara would be hosting, supporting, and promoting this uh, group of um, conversations on this topic. And uh, without further ado, I am Gabriel Guerra. Um, I am going to be moderating and provoking today. And um, I would love to welcome, if I may, in strict alphabetical order, uh, Jody Dean, who is currently in Geneva, on the Geneva on this side of the Atlantic in New York. Thank you, Jody. Thank you. I am really happy to be part of this conversation. I want to start out by giving a little bit of context and definition to this very popular term, neoliberalism. Um, it's typically associated with privatization and marketization, often linked to the post-welfare state, to post-Keynesianism. We could add in here its um, connections with globalization. Um, then, you, then there's also austerity or precarity capitalism, which we can think of as, can, as neoliberalism viewed from below. Um, other designations that are part of our economic and political present focus more on um, digital networks and information. And so add in um, terms like platform capitalism, cognitive capitalism, communicative capitalism, digital capitalism, and then surveillance and algorithmic capitalism. We can also add to this list of designations of our political economic president, um, Brett Christopher's um, new discussion of rentier capitalism. And this is a form where accumulation strategies involve having rather than doing. Finally, as part of the sort of terminolo terminological list of uh, these critical um, ideas of contemporary capitalism, we might add in those that focus on climate change um, and see definitions like capitalism or carbon capitalism or the capital capitalist scene. Now, all of these different terms um, for present economic society um, all need to be connected not just with our present understanding, but with earlier designations like imperialism, monopoly capitalism, and finance capitalism. They also accompany a vocabulary of racial capitalism and patriarchal capitalism. And this vocabulary tries to draw out the ways that economic exploitation always depends on sex and race depression. Finally, as we sort of um, proliferate this archive of terms for the present economic and political formation, we should keep in mind that they're, they're accompanied by a bunch of terms that um, say we've moved beyond capitalism altogether, um, as you implied in the introduction. Paul Mason, for example, is one of those who suggested that our era is post-capitalist. Slavoj Žižek has offered the term liberal communism. Um, as the name for that elite associated with Bill Gates and George Soros. Uh, Zizek, sort of perversely here, posits their philanthropy as a kind of capitalist self-negation, writing, 
Today's capitalism cannot reproduce itself on its own. It needs extra economic charity to sustain the cycle of social reproduction. We might as well um, add into this list then Anthropocene as another post-capitalist name, um, particularly given its uptake among critical theorists um, insofar as Anthropocene signals a move beyond political economy to the epochal and geologic, to something outside the time of human production altogether. Now, these different names um, are connected with different analyses and different politics. The terms point to different sets of problems, dynamics, property relations, power relations, sites of struggle, and so on. To my mind, the best um, theorizations specifically of neoliberalism are those that describe it as a reactionary class response, as a class project of wealth appropriation. And here, um, Gerard Dumanil and Dominique Levy are really strong. Also, Robert Brenner, right? Brenner is great on this because he gives us neoliberalism as the politically driven upward redistribution of wealth. I'll say this one more time because it's really, really essential. The politically driven upward redistribution of wealth. And what's so important here is that it recognizes the neoliberal use of the state, what Paul Passavant has theorized as a strong neoliberal state. So neoliberalism has been a counter-revolutionary project, a reaction of the capitalist class to declining rates of profits and the social upheaval of the 60s and 70s. It was never just about markets and free trade. My cat's trying to help participate in this conversation. Um, it's never been just about markets and free trade. It's always been a state project that involves using the state, state laws, interstate treaties, financial regulations and institutions to redistribute wealth from the middle to the top. Now, my view is that neoliberalism is being replaced by something worse, what I call neo-feudalism. More precisely, capitalism's own dynamics are turning in on themselves in a kind of absolute subsumption with new kinds of lordship and servitude, new lords and new serfs, a micro elite of platform billionaires and a massive service sector or sector of servants. My wager is that neo-feudalism gives us an image of the present that lets us make sense of contemporary inequality, finance, fragmentation, flexible platforms and service labor, and the crises of social reproduction. It lets us see all of these as interrelated elements of a single tendency because it gives that tendency a name, right? It says it's neo-feudal. So all those different terms that I began with actually name different aspects of what we need to see as a whole formation, right? We, what we need to see in terms of neo-feudalization as a tendency. The combination of monopoly concentration, intensified inequality, and the subjection of the state to the market are resulting in a neo-feudalism where accumulation occurs as much through rent, debt, and political power as it does through commodity production. Globally, in the knowledge and tech industries, for example, rental income accruing from intellectual property rights exceeds income from the production of goods. In the US, financial services contribute more to GDP than manufactured goods do. Increasingly, capital's not reinvested in production, it's hoarded, it's eaten up or redistributed as rents. So value is decreasingly self-valorizing, right? To use the terms from capital, right? Value is not self-valorization, self-valorizing anymore. It's de it can't do it. Valorization processes have spread far beyond the factory into complex, speculative, and unstable circuits, increasingly dependent on surveillance, coercion, and violence. By calling these tendencies in our present neo-feudal. I'm also signaling a change, not just in this kind of production part, in the capital accumulation part. I want to signal a change in labor relations. Today, the ideal of freely contracted labor that justifies and co conceals coercive class relations is untenable, right? It's not, it's not concealed anymore. Not even the barest fantasy of freely given consent accounts for the social relations of capital accumulation today. Most folks have no choice but to work 
and many of us have no work to choose. In the service-dominated economies of the global north, majorities work in service sectors. Some find that their phones, bikes, cars, and homes have lost their character as personal property and been transformed into means of production or means of, for the extraction of rent. Tethered to platforms owned by others, consumer items and means of life are now means for the platform owner's accumulation. Some of us enjoy the fantasy that our service is creative, that we are members of a privileged class of knowledge workers, yet much of that work is increasingly done for free, maybe with a chance of pay. Knowledge workers, like day laborers, often have to compete for contracts, and if we win, then we get to work for a wage. Most of us constitute a prop most of us constitute a propertyless underclass only able to survive by servicing the needs of high earners for instance as the 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 teachers and instructors of their children their personal assistants their trainers their tutors their cooks or their cleaners over the next 10 years the occupation that's um, is predicted to add the most jobs is personal care aides not health workers, but aides who bathe and clean people. Another age would call them servants. The waged are further expropriated of our minimal incomes via unavoidable debts, fees, fines, and rents. In the US, for example, taxes on people are redistributed to corporations. For example, in 2018, 57 corporations, including Amazon, not only didn't pay taxes, but they got tax rebates, they got money back. So the US government squeezes its citizens for money to pay back to corporations. The neo-feudal hypothesis does not imply that contemporary communicative or networked capitalism identically reproduces the features of European feudalism. That's not the argument. In fact, historians have successfully demonstrated that the very idea of a single European feudalism is a fiction. Different feudalisms developed across the continent in response to different pressures. And that's just Europe, right? There's feudal relations in all sorts of countries. View, viewing contemporary capitalism in terms of feudalizing tendencies, then it's not about the past. It's about looking at a new socioeconomic structure that has four interlocking features. So these four interlocking features are parcelated sovereignty, new lords and serfs, hinterlandization, and a kind of catastrophism. That's the affective version. I'm gonna say a little bit more about these four and then close. So the first attribute of neo-feudalism, parcelated sovereignty, refers to the blending together of political and economic power in the context of a generalized fragmentation. So if you think about old school of feudalism, you know, we imagine lots of little fiefdoms where lords ruled, um, they extract surplus um, from peasants through legal coercion, and the coercion's legal because the lords are the ones who make the rules over those in their domains. In today's version, private commercial interests displace public law. Confidentiality agreements, non-compete rules, compulsory arbitration, the dismantling of public regulatory agencies, and so on, give private entities power that was previously exercised by the state. Further contemporary examples of fragmentation and the merger of state and economic authority, characteristic of the parcelization of sovereignty, include the fact that 10% of global wealth is hoarded in offshore accounts to avoid taxation, that is, to escape the reach of state law. Law doesn't apply to billionaires powerful enough to evade it. Libertarians try to, gut, um, try to gin up enthusiasm for cryptocurrencies. Why? So that the currencies can avoid any kind of state regulation, any kind of state law, any kind of taxation, any kind of state power. Another example, the largest tech companies have valuations greater than the economies of most of the world's countries. So cities and states relate to Apple, Amazon, Microsoft, Facebook, and Google as if these corporations were themselves sovereign states. Cities negotiate with them, they try to attract them, and they compete, and they, and they cooperate with these different firms on terms that the firms set. Immense concentrated wealth has its own constituent power, the power to constitute the rules it will follow or not. A final example, 
foreign investors have the right to sue state governments in international tribunals. And they often do this when public interest regulations that are designed to protect water, communities, and the environment threaten to reduce the value of their investments. Right? A large number of these cases have been brought by Canadian mining exploration firms against Latin American governments. So I've, so I've been emphasizing just this one aspect of neo-feudalism, parcelated sovereignty. There are three other aspects. Like the second one is these new lords and serfs. And um, I associate that with platforms like Uber that supply servants to the privileged class. The next attribute is hinterlandization. And by that, I, I, I want to designate the kind of sites of loss or the desolated landscapes of abandonment that house giant distribution and call centers and the decaying housing and transportation infrastructures that mark neo-feudalism. Um, politically, we see this, this fact of hinterlandization manifest in the renewed interest in social reproduction and the crisis of care. Hinterlandization, in other words, marks the loss of a general capacity to reproduce the conditions of livable life. And it appears in rising suicide rates, drug overdoses, and in the US, um, the psychotic societal self-destruction of mass shootings. Right? It appears in collapse infrastructures, undrinkable water and unbreathable air. And then the fourth um, characteristic of neo-feudalism is this right. affect, the overwhelming affect of catastrophism and despair. And I can go into more detail in this in the discussion. But to conclude, my claim is not a historical one about feudalism's fundamental structure. This is not a return of the repressed. Rather, it's that neo-feudalism lets us make sense of changes in the present. It lets us see, it lets us change how we view capitalism today. Seen in light of neo-feudalization, fragmentation appears as a feature of the current setting. It's not to be embraced as some kind of democratic pluralization or the multitude of singularities, right? It's a, it's a component of the new structuring of economic and political power. Likewise, the rejection of reason and embrace of mysticism aren't indicative of creative flourishing. They correspond to the fears and anxieties of catastrophism and apocalypticism. So in sum, my view is that neoliberalism is no longer an adequate term for the present. We're living in something worse, neo-feudalism. Thank you. Uh Jody, that is that is um, I think very thought provoking, but also I think it's very helpful to talk about what it is uh, that we find ourselves in and that we are supposedly exiting or not. I couldn't help but remember um, a very controversial text at the time on the on the more perhaps on the more shallow end of uh, political uh, analysis. Uh, which was uh, this so-called end of history uh, by Fukuyama, and how I remember I was I was at the time uh, I was living in the um, in the Soviet Union and uh, seeing what the decline of the Soviet Union was about, you couldn't help but wonder if anyone had bothered to look, for example, at the Central Asian republics, which today happen to be some of the most um, devolved and at the same time richest former regions of the um, of the Soviet Union, but I think what we what we missed all along is the concept of evolving history at different paces across the world, and how yes whether we find ourselves in the neo feudalism that you describe whether we find ourselves elsewhere and thought well hopefully. Uh, help shed some light on where we are and what we should be thinking about. The basic point I think we should bear in mind is that even, you know, whether it's neoliberalism, whether it's um, capitalism with a social conscience or, or social democracy as we saw it in Europe in the 70s, 80s, uh, whether it is uh, neo-feudalism, it is practiced and experienced in radically different ways across the, uh, the world. I think many of the things you described today from a Mexican perspective can be seen anywhere from 
the high rises of the Santa Fe Business District in Mexico City to the coffee plantations in Chiapas or Oaxaca, where everyone is living their own uh, new, brave new version of um, neo-feudalism or whatever it is uh, we find ourselves in. Todd, um, what is happening to thought in this process? Because the economic impact of what we're living through is, I think, clear for all to see. Obviously, the pandemic has been an accelerator uh, for good, for bad. You know, if we if we believe in the concept of, uh, you know, collapsing the status quo as a way to transform it, then perhaps the pandemic has been the most dramatic social agent of the last 50 years. But what is happening to thought? What is happening to education? What is happening to the whole concept of learning? And when I say learning, I am not only referring to education, but referring to life as a whole. We have never had so much access to so much information, yet the concentration of knowledge, just like the concentration of riches, appears to be the most unequal in recent history. What can you tell us about that and about anything else you may want to open with? <laughs> Good. Well, first, let me thank you uh, for, for moderating and Jody for the analysis. It was a, a lot put on the table uh, in, a, in a short period of time, uh, and I really appreciate that. Uh, I was going to talk about two things, but I th I'm going to sort of defocus on one and focus more on the other. Uh, and then get back to the education question, because I, I think it's related to the second thing. So I, I wanted to talk about first the political and social. And I'm going to talk about that more briefly, because Jody did a, a really good job of, of sorting some of that out. And second, what we might call the constitution of people, how people are constituted, how they're created in, under different kinds of conditions. So uh, that's where I'll, I'll focus a little bit more. And I want to use two terms. Uh, one term, of course, is neoliberalism. Uh, and the other term I want to introduce, and it's just a, a bit of a placeholder term, I'm going to call it the new nationalism. Uh, and in some sense, it's not new, and in some sense, it's not nationalist. But at least it will help give us uh, some initial grip on what I'm trying to get at, particularly around the constitution of people. So one of the things that Jody was on about uh, was the, the role of the state in the earlier neoliberal period. Uh, because I think there's a story that sometimes gets told uh, around the new nationalism. And for, for new nationalism, you can think of figures like Trump and Orban and what's going on with Brexit, that the story that gets told is that we used to be in an unrestrained, corporatized, globalized world, and that's screwing around the people in this country or in that country. And what we need to do is take care of our own first. That we need to take care of Americans uh, before we worry about the rest of the world. And so it's, it's seen as a reaction to globalization, right? And the idea that corporations rather than states are controlling things. But as Jody points out, that's, that's, that's not actually true. Uh, that states have been very involved uh, with the Washington Consensus in, in neoliberalism, uh, and states are very involved now. So it, it, I don't think this is a movement, that the shift that we're seeing uh, from a dominance of neoliberalism to an emergence of what I'm calling new nationalism, as a shift from focus on corporate globalization to focus on, uh, let's say, the internal politics of a state, uh, because they have always been woven together. There is something going on uh, around, uh, 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 there's a shift going on that has something to do uh, with economics. And I think Jody has, has detailed it some, but I don't think that what it is, is what we're often told it is, which is we're gonna take care of our own now uh, and quit worrying about the rest of the world. Uh, with that, let me shift to this idea of the constitution of people, because that's something that Jody didn't talk about, and maybe I have a little contribution to make here. Neoliberalism, the way in which it tried to constitute people was, as you know, Foucault uses the term homo economicus, that each of us is entrepreneurs of ourselves. This comes largely out of the Chicago School of Economics, uh, 
tracing back to Theodore Schultz right, and his concept of human capital. So the idea is that what human beings are, are bundles of capital. And it's not just, not just money capital, right? You know, people's uh, you know, athletic skills and their is capital, their intelligence is capital, their educational level is capital. And so what human beings do is each of us invests our capital for some sort of return. Uh, that return can be monetary, but it, it doesn't necessarily have to be. It can be meaningfulness, it can be further education, it can be for your family or your friends, but that what we are are fundamentally entrepreneurs of ourselves. Now, I've, in some of my writing, I've had the idea that I, I think there's actually another kind of figure here in neoliberalism, not just the entrepreneur, but also the consumer, uh, that we see ourselves in many ways, or, or we are uh, um, encouraged to see ourselves as consumers. Uh, so in classes where, where people have taught, professors have sometimes said that they, students will be on their laptops and if they're not as entertaining as what's going on on their laptop, but they're gonna, the people will look at their laptop. So, but both of these, the consumer and the uh, entrepreneur, these are very economic concepts. Uh, they, they encourage us, uh, us to think about ourselves in economic ways. And there's a way in which neoliberalism was very good at producing neoliberal people. Because if you want to create a person that thinks of themselves as human capital, investing right, for some kind of return, one thing you can do is you can stop giving them any social help. You can throw them out on their own. And when you start, start throwing people out on their own, they're going to think, okay, what are my resources and how can I best invest those resources to continue to survive? So some of the withdrawal of, from the public sector, the, the privatization, the deregulation associated with neoliberalism was very good at producing neoliberal individuals. But here's where I think what I'm calling the new nationals uh, is involving a shift. Now, it's, it's not that this has displaced neoliberalism, but rather I think it's, it's alongside it in a way that withdraws some of the domination uh, of the neoliberal individualist economic thinking about who we are. And this is thinking about ourselves in terms of national categories, but by national categories, I want to say largely group categories, not just U.S., but deeply things like white folks uh, and uh, having a sense of who it is that we are as a group. So rather than thinking of ourselves as individuals investing in a market of other individuals, there's a, a sense of group identity being promoted. Uh, and that group identity is going to have a deeply racist element aspect to it. Uh, one of a, a friend of mine w w who was talking about identity politics and the the charge that that the left descends often into identity politics, which I actually have some sympathy with. He said, "Well, actually, he says if you look historically, right, the most successful identity politics movements, white folks, right, they're really good." At, at, at having a sense of identity, right? Uh, so what I think we're seeing uh, alongside and in some sense in tension with the neoliberal individual is a, a new sense of who I am that is rooted in a sense of myself as a member of a certain cultural group. Uh, and that membership in a cultural group gives me a sense of meaning and gives me a sense of identity. And one of the things that it can do, and this is going to, this I think will intersect with something that Jody said earlier, is um, if I'm thinking about myself as a member of a group and taking my identity from that group membership, I'm pulling away a bit from the economic struggle uh, because I'm seeing my meaning as arising somewhere else. And I think that, that, that what, for, for instance, in our country, what Trump did as president was he spoke to people about their economic marginalization, but didn't do anything about it. In fact, he 
he helped corporations. But at the same time, the rhetoric that he employed encouraged people to think of themselves as members of, you know, let, let's say displaced white folks who are entitled to more than they get. And the problem is that you have these immigrants coming in right, and these black folks who won't work. And so we have to think of ourselves as a group with a certain identity. There's an us there. And what's called Trump's base, what unites Trump's base uh, is not just economic. In fact, I think it crosses a number of economic lines. I think what unites Trump's base is a sense of cult, we could say cultural whiteness, right? And that I think is the new nationals, but it's going to, if we're thinking about ourselves that way, and if we're taking meaning that way, then it's going to have several different implications. But right? right? one is that it's going to defocus on any economic struggle. It's going to encourage you to think not economically, but to think, say, racially and culturally. Uh, so that that will be one of its effects. Right? Uh, and the other thing is this. Uh, if we move away from the economic realm, it's often, I think, and it's a question that, and this is the philosophical question, right? Uh, it's a question that of what makes life meaningful for us. And if we think that what makes life meaningful for us is what we get in return for our investments, we're going to live very differently from if we think of the meaningfulness of my life is to be, you know, culturally like other white folks. Uh, I think we're going to act differently under those conditions. And now, just to, to wind it up, uh, Gabriel, let, let me just turn to this so the education, idea of education and thought, because we're, I think we're seeing the new nationalism here. Uh, the critique in the U.S. of what's called critical race theory, right, as though kids in grade school are studying legal scholars on issues of race. Uh, uh, the, this, I think, is a, a project to, in the new nationalism, to get people to think about themselves in certain ways. But the, when you take a text like Toni Morrison's Beloved, right, one of, not just one of the great novels in the US, one of the great novels of the 20th century, right, and say that is a divisive piece of literature which we should not be reading because it calls out issues of race and violence and things like that. You're encouraging white folks to think about themselves in a certain way, right, which is gonna involve the marginalization of, of, of African-Americans uh, and one thing, of course, Jody, I, I, would, I think, would quickly point out, and I wouldn't disagree, is that that also can have the effect of, like a lot of these strategies, splitting working class folks, right? That's one thing it can do. But I think also it, it shifts how we think about the meaningfulness of our lives in ways that would have effects that I think are going to be hard to tell. I, mean, I, I have to confess a little bit of hesitation in, the, in my discussing this, because I always feel like when I'm talking about what's happening, like to analyze for me, to try to analyze what's happening in the present, I feel like I'm playing a fool's game, right? Uh, like it's easier to look back and say, okay, here's, here's where we went, than to say, here's where we're going. I think Jody gave a, a really eloquent right, proposal for this, but I feel like something's happening here alongside the nationalism, um, alongside the neoliberalism with this new nationalism. So you see neoliberalism still having its effect in things like how we react to COVID. So what, how, would we, how are we reacting to COVID in the US? We're all individuals, we're all free. We can do what we want. I don't, I don't answer to anybody, right? I think that's a neoliberal hangover. But we also see the new, uh, the new nationalism in, in ways associating oneself with certain groups. Thank you. Um, thank you, Todd. I, th I think this this concept um, that you're putting on the table, uh, the new nationalism as a distractor, uh, if, if I understood correctly, and this uh, idea of rhetorical empowerment, uh, as opposed to real empowerment of um, different sectors, but especially of the middle class or of the working class, I think is particularly re relevant. In the in the US, the ascent of Trump can be very 
easily explained and understood by the decline of the middle class at a period of great creation of wealth and great accumulation of wealth. And at the same time, at the, you know, the slow ascent, uh, but real, even though very slow, of the poorer sectors of the, um, uh, of the social fabric, wh which resulted in the middle classes feeling further away than ever of their aspirational goal of the, you know, the Joneses, and more and more threatened by those that they used to look down upon and that were suddenly moving into their neighborhoods, competing with them for jobs, what have you. So this concentration of wealth, and I think, you know, if the U.S. is a, a prime example because of its size, uh, Mexico, uh, we say, doesn't, uh, doesn't sing too poorly in that choir, uh, to try to paraphrase a Mexican saying, no cantamos mal las rancheras. Um, uh, Mexico has uh, one of the most unequal distributions of wealth uh, in the world, which has not changed. And again, I, I, I would like to go back, back to this idea of COVID as a social accelerator, a uh, social political accelerator, in the sense that it's made us more and more aware of these disparities the global, the local, the regional. In Mexico, it was all about who could travel to the U.S. to get vaccinated and who was willing at the beginning, especially to flout the rules of the U.S. in order to do it. And then afterwards, who was able to do it, you know, legally, officially, sort of, again, even migration, you know, has different, uh, uh, levels and even vaccination has social classes to deal with. But uh, again, COVID has seen some of the greatest creations of wealth in recent history. And all we need to look to do is look at um, Silicon Valley, just as one example, or Amazon or, or, or what have you. And what we as consumers saw as liberating you know, to be able to order anything off the internet and receive it at home quickly without any risk resulted in a new class of serfs, uh, which for all practical reasons, at least in Mexico, and I believe also in the US, work social security and absolutely no benefits to speak of sort of as errand runners, that is, the greatest job creation that has come along. The, in, in, in. So the threat of new nationalism, I saw it up close in Europe. Um, it's you know alive and well all over the place. How do we counteract that? How do we, how do we go away from this? Because we all like to say, oh, this only happens somewhere else. This only happens to the Poles or to the Hungarians or to the Croats, or, well, okay, yes, the Germans, but the Germans, they've got a grip on it. And yes, well, the Americans, but the Americans. And then we turn around and we see our neighbor engaging in that same thing. So how do, how do we deal with that? And how do we deal with this concentration of wealth that becomes concentration of prejudice and ignorance and that perpetuates? I like that part where you spoke of how uh, the, 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 the perpetuation of neoliberals, you know, neoliberalism creating more neoliberals, although I think um, the, the silver lining in that, if it is silver, is that neoliberalism was not able, and I'm using the term, Jody, don't look at me as hands, please, uh, not that you are, uh, I'm using it just for, for terms of simplicity in this conversation. Um, neoliberalism cannot perpetuate itself because it has not been able to satisfy a sufficient number of individuals in the world. At the end of the day, it, it sought to perpetuate itself as you stated, Todd, but it is actually fighting itself on, on its own turf in terms of, you know, it's creating more many more poor than actual beneficiaries of the of the model how do we deal with that and we we we, we have limited time uh, 
for all humanity, but us in the session. So we 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 we, we should maybe uh, have a back and forth on. Um, I'm I'm not sure if Lenin is my go-to quote. Um, you should leave it in this case definitely. What do we do? Good. Um, Can I, um, I go, ahead. go ahead? Okay. No, I know a, a, a clarification, uh, and then I'm going to turn Jody. I'll, I'll turn to you for the question: of What we do, uh, and then I'll, I'll come back to that because I have some thoughts. Maybe, to, but maybe they'll just bounce off of you. So, one clarification, Gabriel: that it's I, it's true that the new 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 nationalism is a distractor, uh, but I don't want to say its sole function is to be a distractor. Uh, I think that would be too reductionist. Uh, the, uh, be, for, to give you one example, I think that there are certain kinds of powers that white folks get thinking of themselves as, as groups of white folks. Uh, there are ways that they get to think about themselves. They can be more openly discriminatory uh, toward, uh, mm -hmm. toward other folks, uh, people of color. Uh, and so, uh, it, it, while the new nationalism distracts from the, the kinds of economic exploitation that's going on, which means it just allows it to continue. On the other hand, I think it does give some forms of non-economic power. I mean, I'm not endorsing this kind of power, of course, but it gives some kinds of power to people if they take their meaningfulness in their sort of cultural identity and then can marginalize other cultural identities. Uh, that's a form of power. Uh, and it's not reducible to economic power, although it intersects with it. That, that was a clarification. Yeah. Yes, I, I, I agree. And it was probably more my interpretation of nationalism, regionalism, racialism as uh, distracting factors, which have, you know, uh, a richness, quote unquote, unto themselves. But Jody, yeah. please. Um, well, I'm glad that you mentioned Lenin, because I actually think, um, and particularly since we don't have much time either here or in a global historical sense, the actual most pragmatic answer is the revolutionary overthrow of capitalism. Now, that seems like a tall order, but in fact, widespread disruption, the growing tensions, the problems right now in, in Europe around um, all of the um, you know, people who are migrating and refugees, the problems on in the Western Hemisphere, we see lots of social upheaval that climate change and economic inequality are only going to get worse. So I actually think that we know the answer for dealing with the problems of the concentrations of wealth, and that is overthrow of capitalism. Um, you said neoliberalism can't satisfy, you know, also, you know, wide numbers of individuals. That was never the goal. But I, this is why I, I, I really think that the interpretations of neoliberalism that recognize that it was always part of a capitalist reaction to the social welfare state and declining re, um, rate of profit are crucial. Right. We have to know it was always capital's interest in maintaining its own uh, power in seizing for itself what is made by the many and these these the sort of trillions of dollars of wealth that have been created um in the last year or two i actually think we we have to recognize as forms of fictitious capital that as soon as the markets collapse as soon as state governments stop feeding money into the markets this will all collapse and it will vanish and the reality of what's produced, the reality of what's needed will reassert itself. I mean, that's with the very beginning of COVID um, in the in the United States. Everybody talked about essential workers and valuing essential workers. And then later on, it's like, oh, you know, we're tired of valuing essential workers. We just want to value our goodies from Amazon. Then that took over more. But, um, you know, the act, I mean, the answers are only complicated if you presume the, con the continuation of the societies and economies we have. If you take the actuality of revolution as your perspective, then the problems actually simplify. Yes, al 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 although uh, we could perhaps argue, and um, I, I don't want to distract from the, from the core of this discussion, that capitalism did have a moment there where it appeared to be actually thinking, uh, a thinking being, a sentient being, and promoted a series of policies that would have made it tenable in the very long run. 
I'm thinking social security, I'm thinking the European models. And uh, this time around, it came back, you know, again, beginning in the 90s with, call it the Washington Consensus, call it the Chicago Boys, call it what you will, uh, with a completely brazen and shameless um, face of itself, uh, if, we, if we could put it um, that way. And that, you know, any Trotsky would be delighted to see capitalism actually acting as the agent of its own subversion eventual subversion, if that is uh, what comes to be. I'm a pessimist and I tend to think that capitalism has a way of reinventing itself all the time. But anyway, um, I'm not the guest here. I'm just the facilitator. So uh, Todd, what would Lenin have us do? Or what would anyone have us do? Yeah, I I'm going to leave Lenin to the experts on Lenin. Uh, I I'm, <laughs> I I'm a little bit, I well, I I'm less optimistic about rev revolution uh, than Jody is. And, and the reason is, well, I, I suppose I'm less optimistic about people uh, in part that when the when things panned out with neoliberalism and a number of white workers got displaced, uh, it was very easy to get them to embrace a reactionary whiteness rather than to look at how it is that capitalism has helped undermine the li their livelihoods. Uh, so for me, if there is going to be a revolution, I worry that's going to go in the wrong direction. Uh, I worry mm -hmm. that it's going to be a right-wing revolution embracing a, a form of authoritarianism uh, that's not going to allow us to move forward. What I what I think the new nationalism, one of the things that it offers us is when there is group solidarity, that offers a solidarity not only to the dominant group, but there could be a solidarity to the marginalized groups. So when, for instance, African-Americans are encouraged under neoliberalism to think of themselves as entrepreneurs, that undermines any solidarity that they might have. I mean, not that there, there was none, but that way of thinking undermines solidarity. But if African-Americans as a group are getting marginalized, right, immigrants as a group are getting marginalized, right, then there can be, uh, as there was uh, in the US, an internal sense of collective identity that can garner right, solidarity and allyship and allow uh, people to move forward. So I think that the the collective cultural uh, aspect of the new nationalism actually offers potential tools for change on the ground by the collective sense of identity that folks will have right, with one another. But in order for that to happen, I think what we need to do is avoid what I call the mistakes of the 90s, which was the siloing of so many of these movements. Uh, they have to see themselves in solidarity with one another uh, and and uh, in seeing themselves in solidarity with, with one another right struggle against the the particular uh, but intersecting ways in which the um, uh, in in which the new nationalism in concert with neoliberalism right has worked now Jody might look at me and say well isn't that revolution right. uh, my well, suspicion is my suspicion is it is it it's something like what I I, I want to I, I suspect would be more like a radical reformism than a revolution. Although no, where is, one dips is, the other. is revolution per se a good thing, uh, Jody, or do we need to look for the right kind of revolution? Um, of course, revolution by itself isn't enough. It has to go in the the correct direction. And so I um, would would advocate for a socialist revolution or a communist revolution. I think that what we can say for sure is that revolution is on the horizon. And then the question is, are we organized enough to push it in the direction it should go? I'm, I have a question for Todd. I think, um, you know, I, I, when I hear you talk about new nationalism, I get it as a kind of a compensatory mechanism for the harms of 
of neoliberalism, but it's also hard for me to extract it from the larger patterns of US history where identity politics, of course, were already becoming a thing in in the 80s, like way before Trump. I mean, honestly, my, my very first book written in the 90s, the early 90s was like Solidarity of Strangers after Identity Politics. Boy, but like talk about you can't predict the future. I said after identity politics 30 years ago. And in fact, the last 30 years have very much been years of identity politics. No after at all. I mean, we know that in I mean throughout the 20th century, there were forms of African American organizing, forms of um, Afro nationalism as a way of confron uh, confronting racism and lynch law and Jim Crow. But then there was also the Communist Party that worked very hard to do to build cross racial alliances. It worked very hard with um, you know to try to integrate some unions, right? The unions that were amenable to it to try to form the class power across races. I mean, the the Communist Party concept, recognized. Let me, let me just interrupt you there, Jody, this concept of comrades that you've written about. But um, we, I, I have someone buzzing in my ear, um, threatening me with um, with a sledgehammer because we're, we're very close to finishing. So before I ask you both to, to wrap up with final conclusions, I just want to throw a little wrench in there on the, on the concept of human solidarity or group solidarity. Um, and a skeptic, a skeptic of human nature and of humankind in general. So I would just remind you that one of the sectors where Donald Trump fared best um, in the last election was among Latinos, and that he did exceptionally well among Mexican Americans living legally in the US, who were the most outspoken proponents of tighter immigration laws. So you know, so much for group identity and group uh, solidarity. But anyway, um, since you're here to deal with the uh, repercussions of the, of the feed closer to home, um, we're going to need to wrap up with um, final thoughts from both of you. This, this conversation could go on for several hours and I'm sure we would keep the audience uh, with us. It's This is fascinating. But unfortunately, we are subjects of another slave master, the clock. So um, Todd, uh, if you if you would like to if you would like to reply to Jody and then at the same time, give us your closing thoughts and then Jody, you give us some final parting words, please. So I, I want to just pick up on what Jody said. Uh, because remember, Jody, I said the new nationalism, in some sense, it's not really new, right? And I think that's right. You've pointed to ways in which it's not. I think it's surging in an overt way that it hasn't surged before. But J Jody, I come, I've spent the last 30 years in South Carolina, right? Uh, and, and, I was born in South Carolina. Well, I, I, my, my condolences for that. The, the, <laughs> the, uh, and, and so you will, you well know, right? Uh, that in the 19th century, right, white identity politics did quite well here. Uh, and so it's, what, what, when I'm pointing to that is not saying this is a new phenomenon, but rather I think there's a certain surging that's emphasizing that. Uh, and you're right, it didn't start with Trump, uh, but I think it, 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 it was coming. And I think Trump uh, and, and the pre-Trump Republican Party I think we're we're building on that and trying to uh, uh, and, and and sort of throwing stuff on the fire. Uh, but just to close, um, I don't want to add anything new because the, you know this conversation has been so rich. So let me just I I, I want to thank Jody. This is the second time I've been on a panel with Jody, uh, and I always wind up learning bunches from her. Uh, and I want to thank you, Gabriel. Uh, or, you know, the, for the provocations, which were gentle. Uh, uh, <laughs> uh, it's it's just been an, an honor to be here. And I, I hope that what we've done is not so much said, okay, now you don't need to think about this anymore, but just thrown some ideas out there uh, that can allow people to think and perhaps correct and change and modify an important conversation about where we are now uh, that is crucial and that, as Jody pointed out, we don't have a terrible lot of time around.
I, I think that's the whole point of, um, of provoking, precisely. No, getting people to continue talking and, and thinking about this after the session ends. Uh, Jody, please, um, if you would, if you would uh, wrap up for, for us what has been definitely, for me, uh, a fascinating conversation. Uh, I've enjoyed it a lot and I've learned so much. Um, Todd, I was particularly happy that you were talking about the constitution of people because when I've been um, presenting this material on neo-feudalism, people keep asking me about, about the subject and about people and I, that's still on the drawing board. And so you've given me a lot to, to think about to help me fill out um, that part of this project. Um, you all both identified as pessimist. Um, I'll um, continue our, our lively debate and take the other side, um, the side of um, what I would call revolutionary optimism. I actually think that history shows that um, working in oppressed people can pull together and um, dramatically overthrow their conditions and build something new. Um, the struggle goes on, the, they can be, be defeated, but they always rise up. Right? The defeat doesn't last forever. The bad guys don't always get away with this. And I think that we have ways of combating um, nationalisms, new and old. And one of those is by recognizing who the bad guys are, who gets rich off of us. Right? Who exploits us? Why is our labor, why is our work going to make Jeff Bezos so, so, so rich and let Elon Musk and these guys go to, the, you know, go to Mars? Like, come on. Right. I mean, we can act, we can rise up and we can go, you know, we, we can um, pull together solidarity strong enough to defeat um, this billionaire class. So I'm optimistic. Well, I, I would close by uh, just by saying that being a pessimist um, frees you from disappointment and uh, doesn't necessarily mean that you will hope for the worst but only that you anything even minimally good like this for example this fascinating discussion in this uh, wonderful fora that is the uh, Feria Internacional del Libro de Guadalajara uh, is proof of gems coming out from even the darkest moments that we are living in. Thank you both so much this has been really thought-provoking uh, I will go back to this session. I made many notes and um, I hope our audience will also look more into what both of you have written and continue to write. Uh, Jody, I know you're active on Twitter. Todd, I'm not sure if I found you on social media. Uh, I believe not. Um, no. But I hope to, I hope to, uh, well, at least you're free from that. Um, <laughs> I definitely hope to have a chance to continue this conversation sometime again in the future. Thank you again so much for sharing your thoughts, your wisdom, and also your hope with us. Thank you, Gabriel. Thank you. Thank you. Y muchas gracias a la FIL por esta invitación. Eh, los esperamos eh, muy próximamente, pero yo los invito a que revisen muy bien esta sesión, piensen, reflexionen, y no dejen nunca de criticar. Gracias.